Um, a little bit about myself. So, um, my name is Matt Duffy. Uh, I'm the catchment officer for the Don Catchment Rivers Trust. And um, what I, uh, my job is basically um, community engagement around rivers, and um, it mainly involves uh, doing environmental tasks uh, on rivers, uh, which involve volunteers. So I tend to organise uh, volunteer days, um, such as like river cleanups. So we'll, um, we'll get a bunch of people down, uh, get them in some waders, get in some litter, litter pickers, uh, jump in the river, and get as much um, sort of plastic and waste out of the river as we can. Um, so that's one side of things, but we also do some um, more involved environmental projects. Um, and uh, this is one of them. This is the, the woody debris uh, things that we do. So um, yeah, just to give you a sort of flavor of what we do. But we also um, do a lot of events such as this one. Um, in neutral times we do a lot of uh, school engagement. Uh, so, you know, we just do, uh, there's lots of uh, different arms of the trust and uh, lots of ways, ways to get involved. Um, just to give a bit of a background on like where my career and where I've come from. So um, I previously worked for an environmental contractor um, uh, in, based in Sheffield called the River Stewardship Company. And that's where I really sort of learned a lot. Um, it was my first job in conservation. And so I learned a lot about uh, how to work in rivers, um, how to stay safe, and um, a bit of theory uh, about river management. Um, a lot of their work was to do with flood alleviation and um, sort, of, uh, sort of helping to combat uh, flooding. And um, so that's what I did there. And then coming to the trust, so I was taking that. There we used to take out a lot of trees, uh, but like since coming to the trust, we've been putting a lot of trees into the river. Uh, so it's it was nice. It's nice to see this uh, the sort of balance, um, a sort of fine line between like flood alleviation and um, improving habitat uh, for fish and um, animals such as that. Um, so um, why do the talk? So yeah, we have been doing a lot of um, this work recently. So I just thought it was a good opportunity to say um, why we do it and the many benefits you get from it and uh, just to see if anyone has any questions about it. Um, so this is us, we're the Don Catchment Rivers Trust. Um, we're part of a wider network of rivers trusts nationally and um, each river catchment has its own rivers trust. So we're the catchment trust for the Don. Um, so this is the team, we're quite a small team at the moment. Um, there's only seven of us. Um, so, uh, and we're currently uh, delivering our Hidden Heritage Secret Streams project and that's primarily based in Chesterfield and it's funded by the lottery, the uh, Heritage Lottery Fund and um, so yeah, that's based in Chesterfield. So this is an overview of the catchment, um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, so, just to give an explanation of the catchment, um, we're interested in basically any water that feeds the Don and its, its tributaries. So it could be um, on the moors, uh, where a lot of the, um, the tributaries start their life. Um, and then they feed into the main uh, River Don. So you've got the River Rother, you've got um, the Dern, and then you've got like the Upper Don. So all these feed into the main River Don and um, they pass through a number of towns and cities um, before um, exiting into uh, the, um, the Humber Estuary around Goul. Uh, so um, we work on a catchment based approach. So what that means is um, we sort of think of the catchment as a whole rather than just um, concentrate on one river. And uh, that's because a lot of the issues that um, rivers face um, can be sort of solved further upstream, uh, can sort of come from upstream but have an impact further downstream. So we need to think of it as a, as a wider whole catchment instead of just um, sticking to one uh, river or stream. So I'm going to talk a little bit about fish tonight as you might have guessed by the title. Um, so these are just two articles that um, I pulled off the internet 
And this sort of just highlights some of the um, threats that fish face. So it mentions um, pollution being a problem, as well as climate change um, affecting uh, fish populations. Um, uh, this article on the right uh, sort of says about um, lower oxygen levels in the water, and we're going to talk about that a bit tonight as well. Um, so yeah, you know, like like a lot of um, nature um, at the moment is um, suffering at the effects of climate change and habitat degradation and um, fish um, aren't alone in that. But hopefully um, I'm going to explain a few things that we can do to sort of help mitigate some of that. Um, sometimes when you think of things like climate change it can be really difficult to um, think about how to solve things like that but what we do is sort of offer a solution to um, what people in the community can do to help their local rivers. Uh, when things like climate change and pollution seems a bit difficult tasks to sort of get a hold on and um, make a, an impact on. So this, yeah, we sort of give people the tools to um, be empowered to make a difference in their rivers, basically. And this is one of the ways that we do it. So um, you might have guessed already what is woody debris. It's, it's a little bit of a jargon term for um, just basically wood. Um, so this can be um, a whole tree like this one that we've put in um, and it accumulates a lot of brash and debris um, that's found in the river. It can be just long thin uh, stems like this. Um, this is an example of a tree hinge so um, this is usually where a branch or a small um, tree is um, it's al almost effectively hedge laid into the river. So uh, you can see the bottom of the, um, of the tree here. It's not completely severed. And um, so what that does is it allows the tree to regrow whilst also um, allowing a bit of woody debris into the river. And these are actually really effective. Uh, I'll show you a picture of um, even though they're really small, um, what effects that uh, that small intervention can have. Uh, this is uh, a thing called a flow deflector. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, it's just another example of woody debris, and, and I'll talk a bit about um, the effects that that has. But I just wanted to show you that as a as an example of of the different types of woody debris that you get. So. Why is it missing from our rivers? Why, uh, why do we need to put it in? And um, I'm, I'm just giving a few examples here of why we might not find um, it in as much as abundance as it should be. Um, so a lot of our water courses are, are managed um, for flood risk. So this is where uh, big trees such as this one pictured um, will be removed from the river uh, for flood risk purposes. So. In 2012, one of the main um, contributors to the floods um, was the fact that they had a lot of big crack willows um, along the, the, the Don. Uh, when the floods came, they all fell off into the river and, um, and backed up against the bridges and caused flooding. And so by removing um, structures such as this, it sort of helps um, the river flow freely. Uh, it's particularly a problem around bridges and culverts. Um, a lot of our um, rivers are, are used for navigation, so uh, boats um, still need to use it. So if you know if a tree does fall in the river, um, we people will need to uh, get out so they can uh, so, so you can uh, use that um, for navigation still. Um, but there's also a lot of over management of our rivers, uh, unfortunately. So. Um, there's an idea that the river needs to be completely free flowing and uh, free of any uh, disruption, uh, such as trees in it. Um, and this is uh, right into, up into a point, like I said, about the um, removing f flood risk uh, debris. Um, but there's a bit of a, a risk averse or like cautious approach uh, to this, where maybe things that don't necessarily need to come out do end up being removed. Uh, so that's why, why you might not find so much of it. Um, also, the idea that it looks a bit messy um, or unsightly, um, it's, it's maybe something that's deeply ingrained within us that we need to see a sort of um, 
manicured um, environment. Um, so yeah, this is maybe another thing that feeds into it. Also, it's just a bit annoying for um, for snagging fishing lines. So I don't know if you've ever tried fishing around uh, trees, but um, yeah, the line tends to get stuck. So it can be really, uh, really uh, quite frustrating to um, to have that happen. And so trees often get removed for that reason as well. Um, and some more reasons why we don't find it in, in as abundance as we should. Um, a lot of our uh, rivers have been changed over time. So um, a lot of the meanders in the river have been taken out and so rivers have been straightened and uh, fixed in place, especially in urban areas um, using walls. So the, the river isn't free to move as it wants. And what you'd get if the river was moving um, freely is you get a lot of erosion. I'll talk about that um, in a second. But um, as, as the sort of banks get eroded, trees will naturally fall in. And this is an example uh, in this picture of a tree that uh, will have fallen in just naturally. And um, so we didn't put that there. And so, they, yeah, this tends to happen um, in rural areas further upstream. Um, where rivers just don't need to be as heavily managed. Um, so what we can do is sort of replicate um, this process of, uh, of woody debris and also what we can do about meanders as well. Um, so we always think of safety first. So um, like I said, um, big structures like this can cause flooding. But what we've done here is attached it to, um, you can either attach it to its stump or here we've attached it to um, a tree root. And so this is um, some nine mil um, metal cabling and uh, it's really strong stuff, you know, um, it's used to hang bridges off, uh, oil rigs, they use this um, type of material. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it, it's going to take a long time to rust through that. And then we've got these um, these cable crimps on it as well. And so we put two on there just as a bit of a of a safety insurance um, purposes, uh, just so in case one of them slips off, uh, we've got that other one. And then here on the right is um, Anthony, our project assistant, uh, fixing one in place. Uh, so this is in Somersault Park in Chesterfield where we've been working. And um, I'll give you a few more example as, examples of uh, what we've been doing up there. Uh, so because we're not able to uh, visit the site at the moment, um, we did a bit of a stop, uh, sorry, a time lapse. And this just is, a, it just shows me and Anthony working in the river and um, we've felled a number of trees on the banks. And so you might be able to see the trees making their way across the river. So we're just winching them um, in place. And uh, so, yeah, this is just to give an example of, what it looks like when we're putting them in, um, just so it's not so abstract. And as you can see, we're putting it on opposite sides of the river, and uh, there's uh, a reason why we why we were doing that, and uh, I'll talk about that now. Um, so, what are the benefits of woody debris? Why do we put it in? Um, so, yeah, there's a whole host of reasons um, why it's uh, really important to. Um, have woody debris in there and why it's important for wildlife. Uh, so this is um, a sort of bird's eye view of what a river should look like. So it's, uh, I'm going to take you back to uh, 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 school for a second in your geography class. So this is a tip, what a typical river should look like. It's got lots of bends in it. And um, so this is a cross section on the right of the river. And um, as you can see, um, on the outside of these bends, you'll get a lot of fast current. And this is where the river's eroding on the outside of the bend. And this is where you get a lot of the deep water. Uh, but then on the inside of the bank, um, it's much um, slower flowing. And this is where a lot of the finer particles will drop out and deposit. So you've got this process of um, erosion and deposition happening and that's what creates um, sort of this diverse habitat and you get lots of different um, animals and plants associated with um, these different habitats and um, 
and I'll go over a few of those. Uh, so this is what the river looked like uh, before at Somersault Park. Um, as you can see, it's straight. It's not like that one, uh, that, that, that diagram that I just showed. It's uh, really straight. Um, if you can imagine just for a second, it's river bed. So it will be just uh, quite flat bottomed. You can see there's, no, there's not re really many ripples, um, which shows it's got a flat bottom. And it's just quite one dimensional, um, just a bit boring, if I'm honest. Um, and it's it will be good for some um, species. We'll get some species associated with this um, type of habitat. But we, what we want is um, a real diverse um, uh, amount of wildlife living in the river. Um, so yeah, just to go over, uh, <laughs> its technical term is hydrogeomorphology, but um, that just means just how water moves in a river and the effect that it has on the river environment. So like I said, um, the flow of water um, scours the riverbed. And um, so as you can see, the stream's moving from left to right. And as it moves over this stone, um, it'll um, move in right angles. So it'll move over the stone and then drop down the other side and scour out the riverbed. Uh, this will cause a lot of the uh, material there to um, be pushed out, of the, out, out with the floor and um, the larger particles will drop out first and then the medium particles drop out next and then the finer particles. So it has an, um, the ability to source particles into different, um, different sizes and create different um, diversity within the river and different micro habitats. And going back to that picture that I showed you earlier, um, that it's, this is like the rock, so water will be flowing over there. And what you'll get is um, a lot of scour um, on the, on the uh, lower side of this, um, of this tree, and you'll get a big pool forming, and that's really important for um, breeding fish. So here's a before and after picture of, um, of Summer Cell Park. Uh, so as you can see, we put it on opposite sides. And um, I've also got a video of the flow of the water. So like I said, um, it does have any meanders in, but we can sort of replicate this by putting these in on opposite sides. So you might be able to see how the river's hitting one of these structures being diverted into the other. And we are getting a bit of an S sh uh, shape like a natural water course should. Um, so instead of you know digging uh, the riverbank and which is quite expensive to like um, create meanders, we can do it quite uh, effectively and cheaply uh, using this method. So as you might have guessed, um, more flow diversity equals more wildlife. Um, so the more sort of interesting um, and sort of destructive um, the flow is to a riverbed, the more different wildlife you're going to get. So this is um, an upland uh, species and um, especially adapted to living in fast flowing uh, rivers such as the Hipper in Chesterfield. And um, so it's called Heptogenida, it's a species of mayfly. It's also known as the flat-headed mayfly and it has that flat head because it needs to be um, hydrodynamic and it has those big arms um, to grip onto rocks uh, so they don't get washed off in the floor. And so these really love uh, flat, um, flat rocks. Um, they, that's, their, that's their habitat they like to live in. That's what they've specially adapted themselves to, um, to live. Uh, and then conversely, we've got this other type of mayfly, which is called uh, Ephoremidae. That's its um, Latin name. Um, but it's also known as the burrowing mayfly. Um, this is just sort of classic uh, mayfly. If, you, if you're um, referring to mayflies, it's usually going to be this one. Um, and so uh, this species of mayfly loves sand. And uh, so it will burrow down in the sand and, um, and live there, basically. Uh, and it'll live there for around one to five years as a nymph, uh, as an aquatic nymph, uh, sort of swimming around and um, eating and growing bigger 
and then uh, once it's ready it'll emerge as an adult fly out of the river and this is what you can see in the bottom right hand corner. Um, just one second. So I talked about this hump being created after we've got um, something like a stone or a rock, or a stone or a, a bit of woody debris. And this is perfect um, habitat for fish to spawn in. Uh, so they need a um, particular sized um, uh, grade of uh, stones to, um, to have their eggs in. And this, um, this just provides them with that habitat. So you get a lot of um, a gravel spawning species such as grayling or trout um, uh, needing this type of habitat. Um, so what else it does is it traps um, organic material. So the, uh, obviously in autumn the leaves fall into the river and um, the dead leaves and the twigs that come off the trees will get caught in the woody debris. Um, if it wasn't there it would just get washed out to, out to sea and, and we'd lose it. And why it's really important is because um, whilst it would, doesn't look particularly um, inviting to us, uh, this is perfect food for, um, for insects. So yeah, you'll get um, accumulation of uh, organic materials such as this. And uh, this is, yeah, this, so this is um, called um, a freshwater shrimp and they just love to eat uh, dead um, leaves. And um, so it's really important for those type of insects. Um, the dipper, uh, which is another upland species that you'll find, uh, eats um, freshwater shrimp. Um, so you, you're starting to build up a picture of, um, of why it's important to have uh, this sort of structural diversity within a river. Um, on a lot of the wood, um, you'll get this thing called biofilm accumulating which is just um, a sort of composite of, of bacteria and algae. And this is really important food for a stonefly. So they'll graze on this um, algae. And um, as they emerge, um, you'll get things such as darbentum bats. These are a really cute species of um, bat that are specially adapted to living uh, along rivers. Um, so if you go down um, sort of dusk and at uh, night time along your river, hopefully you'll see a few of these um, along there. And so they like to glide along the top of the river, um, sifting the, uh, the water, like sort of trawling the water uh, with their feet. And they'll try and capture some of these emerging um, insects off the river. Um, also, another species that likes to uh, eat emerging flies, uh, such as this merfly, is um, trout. So yeah, they'll just take them off the surface of the water, but they also like to eat the, the nymphs as well that are in, uh, in the riverbed. So yeah, it, it's, that's just to sort of give you an example of why it's really important to um, provide opportunities for all these um, uh, insects to flourish, which has a knock-on effect to all these different animals that live in and alongside uh, the river. So not only does it provide food uh, for fish, it also provides a home. Um, so it provides like a physical cover for fish to go and hide in. Um, so this is really important if uh, you get uh, sort of nurseries of fish um, uh, trying to escape predators. And obviously we don't want the predators to go hungry, but at the same time, we don't want all the fish to get eaten. Um, so it just gives, it sort of balances out the predator-prey relationship um, uh, for these uh, fish fry. It also provides um, a place for them to hide um, in, uh, in flood conditions. So um, when a flood happens, um, often a lot of the fish do get uh, swept out to sea, unfortunately, where they, um, they can't survive uh, in the saline conditions. Um, so a lot of them will die. So it's, it's really important to have somewhere for fish to hide in, away, uh, away from these fast-flowing flood conditions. Um, usually we'd get a lot of uh, these uh, things called fish refuges, uh, where fish can go and hide in. 
um, away from floods water, but um, we're missing a lot of these. So this, uh, by having woody debris, um, it just provides a sanctuary basically for them. Uh, and also as fish um, migrate up and down the river, um, it just makes it easier to move up and down. So um, it disrupts the flow um, around the woody debris, um, slows it down and, um, you know, fish can make their way upstream a bit easier. Uh, so I, li I, I like to compare it to a sieve. So um, woody debris almost like sieves the river. Um, and, and so what I mean by that is um, it takes a lot of the finer particles out of the water. So um, you might get a lot of run runoff from agricultural um, land. So that's where the soil um, is washed off into the rivers. And, um, and so by having woody debris, um, it slows the water around the, uh, the uh, around it, and this is, gives an opportunity for the particles to drop out and form a bank. Um, it also has an effect of narrowing the channel. So I mentioned about the hinge earlier. Um, so what we did here, so this is on the moss, um, which is um, known to suffer from a lot of sediment, a lot of soils, a lot of silt in there. And it just um, sort of, it comes together in sort of a cake mixture along with the riverbed and it's, uh, it's just no good for um, fish spawning. So what, it, what this does is it narrows the channel. Uh, this has an effect of speeding up the flow. And as you speed up the flow, um, it cleans away a lot of the finer particles, but you also get a lot, of, a lot more oxygen um, feeding the eggs as they develop. So this is just a few pictures of the developing eggs that you'd find in a fish nest. Uh, just to extend the uh, the kitchen utensil metaphor, um, I like to think it also like whisks up the water as well as sieving it. Uh, so this has an effect of like physically mixing the water. Uh, so we talked about pollution uh, being an issue um, that affects fish. So as well as um, decreasing oxygen levels. So this introduces more um, dissolved oxygen into the water for fish and uh, invertebrates to breathe. Um, and this also, um, it, it speeds up the process of breaking down uh, pollution and pesticides that you might find in, in rivers. Um, a bit less of a, a, a fun one, but it does um, reduce bank erosion, which can be important um, for protecting adjacent footpaths. Um, and also, if, um, if there's a sort of important bit of agricultural land, um, you can sort of reduce um, rivers eroding by using uh, woody debris to stop the erosion on the, on the bends, basically. Uh, so this is a picture of Somersault Park. Um, this was taken around September time, so just before the leaves fell off the trees. And um, as you can see, it's a pretty dark place. There's a bit of dappled light, but um, it's almost 100% shared. And um, so we've done, by, t by uh, using the material along the bank edge, by uh, felling a lot of the trees on, along the banks, we um, actually open up the canopy um, and this allows light into the, the river and which is really important for um, the photosynthesis of in-channel plants. So this is um, a, a species called water crowfoot, um, which fish love to and invertebrates love to li live in. Whenever we're doing um, uh, river samples, uh, I like to get into this uh, stuff with the net because you, you get loads of invertebrates living in it. Um, also, it doesn't look very uh, tasty to us, but um, uh, algae needs light to, uh, to be able to grow. And this is also great food for um, invertebrates to eat. But on the flip side, it's not all about um, bringing light into the channel. It's also about bringing shade. Um, so as I mentioned about climate change, um, whilst our rivers are getting hotter and hotter, um, when they do exceed around 27 degrees, 
there is a lot of a uh, lot less dissolved oxygen in the river and this causes um, a lot of fish deaths um, so by introducing woody debris um, it physically shades the river so it provides um, provides shade to keep rivers cool um, but also it starts off the process of succession so you'll get um, uh, seeds um, deposited from upstream in the river, uh, tree seeds sorry, and uh, they'll get trapped in the woody debris and so in places such as this where there's no trees, um, uh, yeah, this river might suffer from excess heat so if we introduce some woody debris here, you get you might start getting trees and plants colonising along the um, along the side. So it, you know it's about finding a balance between light and shade, and it's about a forty sixty split. So you want about forty percent light to sixty percent shade, um, which I think this uh, river achieves. So yeah, um, looking forwards. Um, why are we doing this sort of thing? I've sort of explained why we're doing it, but uh, just to give you sort of real life um, example of why it's um, really important to improve the habitat for rivers. Um, this is a picture I took of um, a salmon in Sheffield uh, last year. Um, it was really exciting to see this. Um, it's the first salmon uh, that I'd seen in the river, uh, in, in the Don. And uh, this is um, a salmon par. Uh, to show that the the salmon are actually reproducing in the river now, um, so that's why um, we need to um, improve our rivers um, for the habitat. Um, so a lot of to, just to give the the sort of salmon fry and the young young fish um, a fighting chance um, to um, make a rebound because we've. Traditionally, we've, we've lost a lot of our salmon from the Don catchment. They've been absent for 200 years and they are making a comeback. So we want to just make sure um, the habitat is right for them. So that ends the, um, the main bulk of the talk. Um, so uh, we've got another talk coming up um, by our Natural Flood Management Officer, Debbie. Um, so she'll, she's going to be talking about that on the 24th of March. So um, sign up to that on Eventbrite on the same place that you found this um, this talk. Um, you can also check out our previous talks. So we've um, this is the more conservation um, talks that we've done, but we did a few um, history talks about the catchment. Um, Rachel did some talks about the um, historic boats that you can find on the on the Don catchment as well as uh, give an overall history of, uh, of the catchment is really interesting. Uh, we've also got a few uh, jobs coming up. So uh, this one, if you know any uh, 16 to 24 year olds that want to uh, get into conservation, um, we've got a six month uh, paid role. It's a really great opportunity um, to start off um, a career in uh, conservation. I did something similar. I, um, I didn't I don't have a relevant degree. I've sort of everything that I've learned has come from on-job experience, and I did a really similar um, initiative when I first got into conservation, and that sort of set me on the track to where I am now. Uh, also, um, if you're just looking for volunteering opportunities, um, we're welcoming new volunteers at the moment, and we've just uh, put a lot of our um, Events uh, we're starting up again after um, the last lockdown. Uh, once the rule of six comes into place again, uh, so we're going to be um, out on the rivers. Um, uh, so hopefully you'll be able to join us. And these are just a few ways that you can get in contact with us. So we're on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, but we also put out a, a monthly newsletter, um, which has all sorts of different um, stuff packed in there. That, um, that the trust is up to and the things that you can find out about us. And so yeah, that's, um, that's everything. So I'd just like to